Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everybody and welcome once again to our weekly Formula for Success live training and this is our weekly training for those of you who it's their first time. This is our weekly training where both myself and also many top experts from around the world share our expertise, share our knowledge, share our experiences, our strategies, or tips that will help you to regain control of your body, mind, and health and also in doing so regain control of every aspect of your life because we believe that you too deserve a fun, vibrant, fulfilling and successful life. Everyone does and the fact that you were on this call shows that you too are interested in making a change in your life. Now, if you're making that first step by actually being on this call, what's key now is that you make the most of it by having pen and paper, asking plenty of questions, but import importantly pay close attention to the presentation because this is going to be an incredible presentation that has the power to dramatically change every aspect of your life during the call as well as after the call and tomorrow. And I'm delighted that, we're going to have, that we have Neil Shah, stress expert for reduced stress to achieve success. And Neil Shah is the founder of Stress Management Society and also he's a businessman, life coach and motivational speaker. He also has a long-standing interest in hypnotherapy and neuro-linguistic programming and has trained extensively in this field. He's a man who's achieved a lot and he knows the power of the mind. He's used this to great effect himself in walking on fire, climbing Mount Everest, running London Marathon, and he's also completed many different triathlons, both Olympic and Ironman distance. He's inspired people all over the world to re reduce their stress and feel the impact on, the, on that, of that on every area of their lives. And what he's going to share with you on today's call, as I said, it's going to be life-changing if you implement it. So remember, knowledge is not power, it's the implementation of knowledge that's power. So make sure to pay close attention, write loads of notes, ask loads of questions, and just enjoy. And Neil, just want to make sure you're there on with us. Can you hear us okay? I sure can, Dave. How are you today? I'm brilliant. Great to have you on, Neil. It's something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Likewise, and it's a pleasure to be here. Great stuff. So, Neil, your screen is showing perfectly. We can see your first slide. So, um, we're ready to get going. As I said, guys, pen and paper, write lots of notes, ask lots of questions. Neil's going to give a great training now, a free training, and then we're going to open up to Q&A afterwards. All right, Neil, over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dave said, I'm Neil Shah. I run an organization called the Stress Management Society. And I'm happy to say that today I'm a happy, healthy, successful individual. I've accomplished many wonderful things. Dave alluded to some of the things that I've managed to achieve in my life. But I want to start by giving you a bit of a background on myself and what qualifies me to be spending the next hour talking to you about stress. Because as much as I may be in a wonderful place in my life today, it wasn't always this way. It was only about 14 years ago that I found myself in the deepest, darkest valley that you could ever possibly imagine. I used to run a multi-million pound recruitment business, which I started when I was 24. By the time I was 26, I'd won the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award and went on to win various different awards and develop it into a multi-million pound business. By the time I was 28, I was bust. I went bankrupt and lost everything. Watched all of my staff, you, you know, I have to, to, to leave their jobs, my car's been repossessed, all my money's gone, and even most of the people I consider to be my closest friends have turned their back on me. Now, as you can imagine, that was a very tough and challenging experience to go through, and I went through massive stress. Didn't recognize it as such, but I went to see my doctor, and he wanted to put me on pills, and saw a counselor, which didn't really help me to deal with the situation or life coaches, did all kinds of things, but I just couldn't get myself out of this deep, depressed, dark valley I found myself in. And there was a moment where I'd been sat in my, my bedroom for the best part of a couple of months and I just, all I could think about is how do I get myself back on top of the world again? I was used to being master of my own destiny, captain of my own ship. And I had this wonderful thought that, you know what, I need to go to the highest place I can think of. I literally need to get myself back on top of the world again. So I decided, and this is a long story for another day, to go to the Himalayas to climb Mount Everest. William Blake said, when men and mountains meet, strange things happen that don't happen when you're jostling in the street. And I had a light bulb moment. I had an epiphany. When you're in an environment where you're spending literally every single waking moment of every day trying to stay alive and get to camp in the evening, it puts all your problems at home into perspective. The fact that you've got no money and the people you care about have turned their back on you are 
massively irrelevant in comparison to the, the task of actually continuing to stay alive. Whilst I was out there, I also had an opportunity to spend a bit of time purely by accident in a Buddhist monastery, which um, was a very uh, enlightening experience. And it was whilst I was there, I had this uh, moment of realization that I'd had this incredible, tough and challenging experience of stress, but I could use that constructively, I could use that positively to help other people that went through this thing of stress, of workplace stress. And I came back and decided to set up the Stress Management Society. And, and as the saying goes, when you are on the path that leads to your destiny, the universe conspires to help you. And, and over time, I've trained and developed and worked with some of the, the leading experts in the world in fields like psychology, health, nutrition, exercise, physical activity, uh, and, and a broad variety of other uh, uh, healing modalities. To, to really help me to develop a good understanding on how people uh, and organizations can recognize stress and know what to do about it. So what is the Stress Management Society? It's a not-for-profit organization that I established in 2003 when I returned from the Himalayas. We're now recognized to be a leading authority on stress recognition, ma uh, stress management, well-being, good mental health. We work with all kinds of different organizations ranging from the NHS to the health and safety executive to oil and gas companies in places like Dubai and in Aberdeen. We work with football clubs like Manchester United and Queen's Park Rangers. I'm sure Dave's not going to appreciate the fact that we worked Manchester United before, uh, being a Liverpool fan that he is. Um, but yes, we get to work with professional athletes, um, we've worked uh, in, in, in top level business, with the medical profession, all kinds of organizations from across the planet. So, you know, we've got a huge amount of experience in helping not only hundreds of companies, but thousands and thousands of people just like you recognize and tackle the impact of modern day stress. And I'd like to share with you some of the things I've learned along the way and, and, and look at how you can utilize some of those techniques and methodologies to increase your resilience, to better equip you to cope with stress. Okay, in terms of sort of uh, additional resources, we've got a, a wonderful website, stress.org.uk, which has a, a broad wealth of resources available. It's in the process of being updated, so keep checking back and you'll find lots of new things on there. But there's lots of stuff there that you'll find even after the call today. So feel free to go and download uh, some of the free books that we've got available for you, and there's uh, audio programs and all kinds of wonderful things. So. Um, the, as I said, like we're, we're, we're relatively well recognized now, and it's through the wealth of experience we've developed with working with such a broad spectrum of people from different parts of the planet, different cultures, different faiths, um, different you, you know, you know, parts of the world, that's really helped us to understand the human syndrome and how the modern day impact of stress it affects everybody, and it's not something that we can hide and shy away from. A lot of people say to me, Neil, does stress really exist? Well, part of what I'd like to do today is just to really help for us to better understand what stress is and how it impacts us, because I can give you the best techniques and the best strategies in the world if you're unable to recognize it, if you can't uh, sense when you're in a state that's not serving you, even the best techniques in the world will never be applied and you'll never get the, 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 the correct benefit. So that's really where I'd like to start our journey. So that's essentially today's goal, help you to understand and recognize what it is, um, and, and also just talk you through a few simple techniques that can change your state, that can take you out of stress very quickly. Um, so the personal resilience is essentially the goal of today. How can we build your personal resilience? How can we better equip you to cope regardless of what life throws at you? So what is stress? And I'd just like you to ponder on that question. Maybe even take a moment to jot down what comes to mind when I ask you, what is stress? You know, if I, if I ask all of you that are listening today, how many of you have experienced stress? And Gary, I can pretty much guarantee that 100% of you are holding your hands up right now because we've all experienced it at some stage or another. And our definition of stress is where demand on a person exceeds that person's resources or their ability to cope. But let's just bring that to life a little bit, shall we? We really struggled with having a clear and concise definition of stress. When we spoke to medical professionals, they had a particular definition. When we spoke to a psychologists, they had a particular way of defining it. We spoke to health and safety professionals, and they've got a, a particular way of viewing stress. And then purely by chance, I came across a, a structural engineer. And um, you know, when I first met him, uh, I didn't know he was a structural engineer. I just said, "Oh, what do you do for a living, then, mate?" We were sat on a plane on the way to New York together, uh, and he turned around to me and said, "I'm a stress tester." I was like, "Wow, fascinating, wonderful! I'm in stress management too. What, what do you do? Are you a doctor, a professor, health and safety professional?" He kind of looked at me funny. He's like, uh, "No." 
So I said, what do you stress test then? He said, bridges and buildings and bits of metal. Because as I said, he was a structural engineer, but he had such a fantastic, clear and precise understanding of stress. And he offered me his definition. And this was his definition of stress. Force over area equals pressure. So even after he offered me his definition, it didn't really make a huge amount of sense to me. So I said, well, can you help me out here? Explain to me what that means. Help me to understand. I'm a very visual person. So he pulled out a napkin. He did a bit of a diagram. And that diagram, that definition that he offered was so clear, so powerful, so concise. It's ultimately what we end up adopting as our definition. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. And it's this. It's a bridge. Now let's look at this bridge. On this bridge we've got like a whole load of double-decker buses and there's like trucks with construction materials on them and there's a cruise ship that's managed to get washed onto the bridge. We've got a couple of Boeing 747s, helicopters, tanks. You know, as you can see, if we put enough weight onto that bridge, eventually it's going to collapse. Whether it's Tower Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Seven Bridge, every single bridge on the planet, if enough load is applied, will eventually collapse. But before it collapses, we will know it's not doing too well. Like the bridge in our diagram here today, you'll see it's bowing, buckling, groaning, creaking. There's some fracturing going on. At this point, we can see that this bridge is really struggling to cope with the load that it's been subjected to. So right now, we've got one or two choices. If we want to prevent this bridge from collapsing, what could we do? Well, firstly, we could use that crane that we've got to start lifting some of the material off. We could take off some of the tanks and we could take off the cruise ship. Or there is another choice. We could reinforce the bridge. We could better support it to better equip it to bear the load effectively. Now, when the engineer is offering me that analogy of stress, the first thought that's coming to mind is, well, hold on a minute. People are exactly the same. Let's say you turn up at work tomorrow and overnight you've had 3,142 new emails are coming. 650 of those are marked as super urgent. You know, deadlines have been moved forward, senior managers that need reports from you. And as you sit down at your desk uh, just to try and get your head around all these emails that are coming, you notice there's some voicemails on your phone. And you pick up the phone, and the first one's from the security guard of your building, just phoning you to let you know your car's just blown up in the car park. And the next message is from your children's school saying that they've got chicken pox and nits at the same time. You need to pick them up and sort out childcare. And the next one's from the council who do some work on your street and have accidentally demolished your home. All right, these are ridiculous examples. But if I kept going in this way and putting more and more pressure, more load, more demand on you as an individual, what do you think would happen eventually? Absolutely. Eventually, regardless of how broad your shoulders are, how mentally tough, how resilient you are, Every single human being on a planet, if enough pressure is applied, will eventually collapse. It doesn't matter if you're a special forces soldier or a stay-at-home mum. We all have different capacity to bear load, but ultimately everyone, every single person, if enough pressure is applied for long enough, will collapse. And that collapse could be serious. It could have very significant consequences. From a health perspective, it could lead to a heart attack, cancer, diabetes, stroke. There are many serious and significant health issues that stress is a contributing factor to. It could be a full-on mental emotional breakdown, which I got very near to when I went through my challenges. Um, it, you know, and sadly, what we're seeing more and more in modern society where people seek the ultimate permanent solution to a temporary problem. And the challenge is, is most people don't recognize it until it's too late, until they've got to a point that the bridge is collapsing or has pretty much gone and collapsed. The key here is, if we're able to recognize it at the bowing, buckling, groaning, and creaking, we can take appropriate action to prevent that bridge from ever getting anywhere near the point of collapse. And recognizing what that looks like, it could be changes in behavior. It could be, um, you, you know, turning to substances, drinking more, eating more, comfort food, you know, chocolates, biscuits, cakes, sweets, that kind of thing, drinking alcohol, uh, consuming more caffeine, smoking more. Some people turn to drugs, both recreational, pharmaceutical. Um, so th there are a variety of ways that this will manifest itself. It could be losing pride in our appearance, people not shaving, putting on clean clothes, washing their hair, that kind of thing. Um, Behavioral changes, so you know, normally a happy, bubbly person could become quiet, quiet and withdrawn, or pe people become more angry, aggressive, emotional.
in unbuckling bridge. So, you know, poor sleep is, is something that is associated with, with people who are quite stressed. So if we're able to recognize what that looks like, if we're able to pick up the signs and symptoms earlier, we can then take appropriate action to do something about it. So here are some things that we can do to start strengthening our bridge. Now, firstly, even before we get to the strengthening of the bridge, if we think about the load on the bridge, you know, there are many things that we can do to strengthen the bridge, but we also do have some options regarding better managing the load. You know, if we, we may not be able to remove the load, but what we could do is restructure it. We could maybe prioritize is it and put it into some kind of a logical order rather than having all of that stuff on the bridge at the same time why not consider actually having the most important things on the bridge and parking some of the things and coming back to them at a later stage so the way i see it time management is a stress management technique time management is the ability and the the, the opportunity to look at the stuff that you have on your bridge and prioritize it and take some of it off temporarily or structure it and order it in a way that it's not so overwhelming and it's not having such a significant impact on your bridge, creating those pressure points which potentially could have some adverse consequences. So, how do we do this? Firstly, look at all of the things that you find on your bridge at any one time and grade them from one to four. A one is something that is urgent and is important. It's a pretty much something you need to do right now. So let's look at some examples of things that would be uh, activities that you need to do right now. Let's say um, you have a request from a senior manager to complete a report and the deadline for that report is five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. It's a pretty much a day's worth of work. You're starting at the beginning of the day. If you know it has to be done by the end of the day, you pretty much need to get on with it right now. If you don't do it, the consequences could be quite severe, and the fact that you've only got a few hours to do it means it's pretty important, so it's pretty urgent. Um, it could be, let's say there's an emergency at work, there's um, like a, a, an accident or something like that, and so we need to attend to it. The, or, or a computer system has uh, gone down. It's urgent because um, you, the, 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 it needs attention immediately. Important, if you don't take action, there could be some serious and significant consequences. What about a number two? Things that we should be planning to do. So this is not urgent in the sense you don't need to potentially do it right now, but it's important in the sense that consequences are just as severe as a number one. Now an example of that is let's say you've got a request to do a report by that senior manager, but the deadline is the end of September. Now the consequences potentially are exactly the same as the one that needs to be done tomorrow afternoon. It's just now you've got a much longer time frame. As opposed to a crashed computer, uh, let's say it's a planned system downtime uh, in a couple of weeks time. Uh, as opposed to uh, an accident or emergency or let's say a fire, it's a fire drill that's been scheduled for October. Again, important, just as important as the actual thing, but not so urgent. You don't necessarily need to do it right now. Um, so the things in, in box one and two are things that you need to find time for and you need to, to have in a structured order. The twos, if you leave them long enough, as I said, become number one, but we can afford to leave those on the back burner. Now where it gets really interesting is the threes and the fours, because even though that they aren't uh, as important in terms of consequences, they do tend to draw on our time and uh, prevent us from focusing on things that really do need our attention and cause our bridge to get overwhelmed. Let's think of some examples there. Something that is urgent but not important. Something that is happening right here, right now, but if you don't do it, the consequences are nowhere near as severe. Let's think of some examples of that. You're sat at your desk, you're working away on that report for the senior manager, and your phone starts ringing. Ring, 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 ring. If your phone was ringing right now, how many of you would feel a sense of urgency to answer it? And in reality, for the majority of people, when their phone rings, they do feel the need to answer it. Now, let's say you answer the phone, and at the end of it, it's uh, one of your colleagues from HR just ringing you up just to find out what your thoughts are about where we should have our Christmas party this year. We're just, you know, uh, uh, asking a few colleagues what their thoughts are and what we should be doing. Now this is taking you away from working on a really important report and you don't know the level of importance of that phone call until you actually answer it. But how often 
how many times during the course of the day do many of you get phone calls and as you answer them you think, oh my god, this is just so distracting and taking away from what I need to be doing. I know for a fact that I would get at least 10 of those phone calls every day and most of them go through my wonderful assistant Gemma, but there are some that end up on my mobile which I you know, have to feel myself. So phone calls and absolutely that you know we we may be in environments and positions where you do need to answer the phone. So we need to think about well how do we if we cannot get rid of that altogether, how do we minimise the time that they impact uh, you know us working on the things that are higher up in our priority order? Um, it could be physical interruptions, people coming up to you and asking questions. I typically am only in the office for about three days a week because I spend a lot of time out on the road with clients and um, you know working on projects. And the days I am in the office, I you know there's about 20 people in in our office. We're a very small company. The I would regularly have people coming up to me and ask me questions. As Neil, I just wanted to ask you. I just need a minute of your time. And I might be in the middle of something. And because we have an open plan office, and I don't have my own personal glass office, which was by design, we wanted to have this completely open door environment, which we thought would be a good thing. What we didn't anticipate is that that leads to a lot of disruptions and distractions and physical interruptions. People coming over and saying, I just wanted to ask you about this. And the challenge is that that could be taking you away from things that are much, much more important or have much more significant consequences if you fail to get them done on time. So you know, consider how you can reduce the impact of that. Maybe that's working from a meeting room or finding a private quiet space or if you work from home, lock the door or go to a library if your family are going to be disrupting you because many people do work from home these days and, and you know, find a way of being able to, to, to shut yourself off or to remove yourself to an environment where you're not going to be disrupted. Um, Maybe sort of visitors you know, knocking at your door. Um, it could be meetings. Um, the the you know a meeting that's scheduled for a particular time. By the time that the, it comes around for that meeting, like for for, for example, uh, and the, I had a meeting at five o'clock today. When the meeting time rolled around, it was very urgent that I was there because I'd uh, agreed to be there. But in terms of how important it was in comparison to the things that I needed to get finished before I left for the day it was much lower down on the priority list. So looking at how you can minimize that disruption or remove it altogether. And number four are the things that are not urgent and not even important. So if you don't do it, there are no significant consequences and there's not even a time frame attached to it. I'd put in there the bulk of your emails. I'm not a fan of emails as much as it is a massive source of communication for us in modern life, it just also it does drain a lot of our time and energy and many of the emails I get, you know, that they, they aren't important, they're not urgent and these are the kind of things that are actually, you know what, if it's not urgent, not important, why are you wasting time on it? Because that's stacking up load onto your bridge, that's causing Boeing and buckling, but if you didn't do them, it's not going to have any impact. So do consider that, do consider how you can restructure and reprioritize that load you find on your bridge to give you a fighting chance of being able to cope. Let's think about some of the things that we can do to actually strengthen the bridge. How can we shore the bridge up so it's better equipped? So I'd like to share with you just a couple of simple things that we can do. There are many, many different things that we can do, but let's just consider some of them. And the quickest and easiest way to change your state is with your breath. Now, as much as I could be offering you some really high-level psychosocial models or analogies around stress, actually the simplest things are the most effective. And at some level, you all know this to be true. Because how many of you have ever heard the phrase said to someone that was panicky and anxious, calm down, take a deep, what? Take a deep breath. Absolutely, because at some level, we all know that the breath is the gateway to relaxation. So I'd like to share with you all a very simple technique. A simple, quick, easy and effective way to change your state. If you find your bridge bowing and buckling, this is one of the simplest and most powerful things that you can do. You don't need any special equipment, doesn't cost you any money, um, you don't need to be you know, anywhere special. This is something you can do anywhere, anytime, any place and you were born with all the tools you needed on board the moment you came into this world. So I'd like to share this with you and the good news is this exercise that I'm about to teach you, if you forget what I'm talking you through right now, 
You don't need to worry because I have recruited millions upon millions of teachers all across the planet. All you need to do is find a baby and copy what they're doing because they will happily share with you their breathing secrets. Hence this exercise being called baby breath. So if you'd like to try this, firstly, I'd like you all to be sitting comfortably, feet flat on the floor, your arms in your laps, or you could do this standing if you prefer. Okay, your spine must be straight and erect. What I would like you to do is imagine there is a triangle, a triangle that starts at your belly button and the corners of the triangle are at your hips. Just visualize inside that triangle a ball or a balloon. And in a few moments we're going to take some deep breaths and that ball or balloon within that triangle from your belly button to your hips, we're going to inflate it fully. At the top of the breath we'll hold and when we exhale we'll pull the navel fully to the spine. And the reason it's called a baby breath is that's how a baby breathes. When a baby takes a breath, you'll see that his belly will inflate and deflate fully, because that is the only way to, to, to fully inflate your lungs. Many of us as adults, we breathe into our chest, very shallow breathing. We're only able to use 35 to 40 percent of our lung capacity. And you know, one of the things I've learned in all of my sporting endeavors, when you're running long distances or doing any kind of endurance event, your breath is so important to help to, to be able to maintain yourself. When you start shallow breathing, you will really struggle. Now, you know, life is a long distance endurance event. You know, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And if we want to get through the marathon distance of life, we need to be fueling ourselves appropriately. And yes, we you know, eating right and staying hydrated are important. I will spend some time talking about that later because I know that, that, that Dave shares my passion on nutrition and, and eating right for well-being. But it's also really, really important to bear in mind, you can go weeks without food, days without water, but you can't go more than a couple of minutes without taking a breath. So if you want the power to change your state, this is where it starts. So before we do anything else, I want us to do this as a scientific experiment. Don't take my word for anything. I want you to be aware of what benefits and changes you are aware of as a result of going through this exercise. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, wherever you're sat right now, you might be in your front room, you might be um, you know, in the bedroom, wherever you are, just look around your environment. Look at colors, contours, shapes. Look at how the lights are shining. Be aware of any sensations you feel in your body. You know, if you're sat on the sofa or on a chair or, or lying on your bed, just be aware of how it feels with your body connecting with whatever it is that you're sat on right now. But be aware of um, the, 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 how the atmosphere feels on your skin. Uh, be aware of any sounds that you hear, other than the sounds um, of, of my voice. What else do you hear around you? And just absorb the whole environment that you're in with all the different senses. And what I'd like you to do is just be aware of how your interaction with the environment changes as a result of doing this little exercise. We're going to do a couple of different breaths and let's just see what happens. Okay, so for those of you who'd like to give this a go, uh, we're going to do this all together. So let's just start. If you're sat, sit nice and upright, feet flat on the floor with your, uh, with your hands in your lap. And if you're standing upright, nice and upright, feet about a hip width apart. In an ideal world, uh, it's better to do this standing up because you'll be able to inflate your, 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 your lungs more fully. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a nice, slow, deep breath in. doesn't matter if it's through the mouth or through the nose. Let's not worry about that for now. And just imagine that ball or balloon in your belly pulling up with air. So we'll do this together. Nice, slow, deep breath in. Once that ball or balloon is full, hold. And let's hold for a few seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. And exhale. Fully flattening the navel down to the spine. And we'll do that again. Nice, slow, deep breath in. Hold, five, four, three, two, one, and exhale. And again, three more, nice slow deep breath in. Hold, and now close your eyes, just focus on the breath and nothing else. Tune yourself out from your physical environment and just be mindful of your breath. Let's turn this into a mindfulness technique where you're focused on just what's happening right now. Focus on your breath and nothing else. And exhale. And again, with your eyes still closed, focusing on the breath, take a nice little new breath in. Hold.
and exhale. And last one, nice little deep breath in. Hold. And exhale. Okay, that was five breaths. That's about 30 seconds of your life. But just be aware of how much can change in that 30 seconds. Once again, look around your room. Look at colors, contours, shapes. How many of you noticed that the lights might be slightly brighter or sharper? Things might look clearer. Be aware of sounds. Now I'm sat in my dining room and I'm sat in front of the fish tank. It's a rather large fish tank. Um, and you know it's been bubbling away the whole time, but I wasn't aware of it. Just from taking those breaths with you, all of a sudden I'm acutely aware of the fish tank bubbling in the background. In terms of the sensation in your body, I just yawned and I felt a little bit of a shiver because I'm starting to relax. Now, again, be aware of all the significant changes that can take place in your body just from taking a couple of slow, deep breaths. Now, that's interesting that, you know, for whatever small changes that you were able to accomplish, no pills, no potions, no special equipment required, and you were able to do that in just a few deep breaths. You were designed to breathe like that 24-7. But many of us sadly have developed very poor breathing habits and, uh, and it's really important that we bring ourselves back to the most natural breath. A baby is not taught how to breathe. A baby does not go to a webinar and have to go through a PowerPoint presentation to learn how to breathe. They come into the world, the doctor slaps on the bum and they do what nature intended. Sadly, many of us have forgotten to do exactly what we were doing when we were babies. Because the good news is, Everybody listening to this webinar, once upon a time, used to be a baby. And once upon a time, you used to know how to breathe appropriately and correctly. Now, it's important that we bring ourselves back to that, to our most natural breath. Maximize the amount of oxygen we get on board, because that changes everything, and it strengthens your bridge. Well, let's consider how we can step the breathing up to another level, and use it maybe to even energize us. A, a breathing equivalent of a Red Bull, if you like, a natural energizing technique. So that's what I'd like to share with you right now. It's a very energizing breath. We call it bellows breath. It's based on a, a, a yoga breathing technique, but it's also used in martial arts as a warm-up. Um, but we're going to suggest that if there is anybody watching this presentation today who is pregnant, has high blood pressure, heart disease, or any musculoskeletal issues, uh, I would advise you not to do the movement element of this exercise because it can be quite vigorous and just focus on the breath on its own. So I'll explain what we're going to do before we start. We're going to be doing this exercise standing up, and we're only going to do 10 breaths, but let's just be aware of, uh, as scientists, what can change from just taking 10 uh, uh, breaths in this particular way. We're going to be, once again, breathing into that ball of balloon in our belly, but now we're going to bring our arms into it. So just imagine, if you're before we start, that we'll be using our arms like the bellows they used to have in the olden days. So what we'll do is we'll start with our, um, our hands by our shoulders and our elbows tucked into our, our ribs. Okay, so your arms are bent, uh, hands up by your shoulders, elbows in the ribs, and when we breathe in, when we fill the ball of balloon up with air, we literally extend our arms upwards above our head. So you've got your arms basically uh, uh, fully upright above your head, and then when you exhale, you pull your elbows into your ribs and force the air out. <laughs> when you breathe in, raising the hands again above your arms filling the belly up with breath, and when we exhale, pull the elbows to ribs. <sighs> okay, we're going to do 10 breaths like that together. If you'd like to give this a go, we're going to start together. I'll be doing this with you, so I'm standing up now also. So stand up, feet hip width apart. If any of you are wearing high heels or anything like that, you probably want to slip them off. Ideally, you want to do this uh, barefoot or, or at least in your socks. So I'll give you a second to do that. If you're wearing shoes, step out of them. If for any reason you're unable to stand, you can do this in your seat as well. It's entirely possible to do it seated, but it tends to work better if you're standing. Okay, so if you'd like to give this a go, we're going to do 10 breaths, but once again, we're scientists. So just observe your environments. Just absorb your environment using all your different senses, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you taste, what you touch, and let's just be aware of what changes as we do this exercise. Do this together. Nice, slow, deep breath in. Start with your elbows by your ribs, hands up by your shoulders. Nice, slow, deep breath in. Breathe in and raise the hands above the head. Exhale, pull the elbows to the ribs. We'll do that nine more times. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. 
Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Two more. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Last one. Inhale, and exhale. Perfect. My dog's even joined in. He's doing bellows breath with us. Good boy. Okay. So how many of you are feeling a little bit more awake or more alert? You may feel the blood's pumping. You might feel a little bit out of breath. You might even be feeling a little bit warmer. Most of you will be feeling slightly more energized, slightly more pumped up. You, you might even have a bit of a head rush because you've got a rush of oxygenated blood uh, up in your brain, which is a good thing. It's your brain saying thank you for the extra oxygen. In fact, some of you might find that there's more movement. You might be more animated. Now, again, all of this was done just by using your breath. You did that 10 times. If I was running a workshop, we'd have probably done that for a minute or two. And a lot of people are supercharged from doing that. This is something when I used to play football uh, a few years ago, uh, we used to do this with the football team before we went out onto the pitch. This is something that I would do um, you know, before I jump into the water, um, before I start a triathlon. Uh, as with Dave, I'm a triathlete, and um, the, 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 it's a great way of pumping yourself up and charging yourself. You know, I do a few stretches and I charge myself up before I get into the water because it really helps to put me into the zone. So this is just to show you that actually there are some simple, easy, effective, powerful ways to strengthen your bridge, but there is many, many more things that we can do. And yeah, I would love to share much more with you, but obviously today we're very, very limited with time. So I'm just going to start talking to you about how we can support you in continuing your journey to develop the strongest possible bridge, where your bridge is best equipped to cope with whatever challenges life should throw at you. Um, and one of them, obviously, is something like getting a good night's sleep. You know, for us here in the UK, we get towards the end of the day. This is uh, well past my bedtime. Um, and <clears throat> actually, right now, I'm uh, going against some of my rules on getting a good night's sleep. But have a good bedtime routine. For any of you that have children, you'd have a, a really important routine with your children to prepare them for bed. You might give them a bath or have a sh uh, give them a shower. You, you'd read them a bedtime story with a warm drink, a cuddle, a lullaby, a massage. And there's certain things you'd avoid with a child at bedtime, like playing you know, games, watching TV, getting them on the computer, uh, giving them sugar or fizzy drinks. Hopefully you don't give them sugar or fizzy drinks anyway. Um, and, you know, these things are really important, but how many of us go against that for ourselves? How many of you would put the kids to bed, go downstairs, make yourself a cup of tea or coffee, turn the television on, open up the laptop, you know, pull out a newspaper and do completely the reverse for yourselves? Well, guess what? We come from the same species as children. We have the same basic needs that they do. So I'm going to encourage you to consider what you can do. You know, uh, as I said, like ensure that you are able to follow some kind of routine, a wind down routine. Maybe that's part of my routine is like, you know, I take the dog for a walk, a gentle stroll around the block as opposed to, you know, a five mile run like I would in the morning. Um, it could be having a, a, a warm soothing drink like caramel tea. Um, it could be some gentle music, some light reading. I could have a bath. I might do some yoga stretches. I might meditate. These are all wonderful ways to help me to wind down before bed. Um, and ensure that you start that program about 90 minutes before. You could use the, the 478 technique of breathing, which is similar to the exercise we just did. You breathe in for four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. If you've got a lot of things going around in your mind, you might want to write them down uh, on, on, in the notebook. But that bedtime routine to help you to avoid you know, getting into bed and finding your mind still racing at 1,000 miles an hour is so important because many people, don't get a good night's sleep and they wake up in the morning and their bridge is already weak because you're tired and you haven't slept well. So this is a really important part of building our resilience. And this is something that we will spend a lot more time talking about in our, our one day workshops which hopefully you'll be able to attend or if you want to spend some more time with us. Um, but there are many ways that you can learn some of the other techniques uh, that we've developed. So how can we help you? Because as I said, you, you know, my biggest stress today is there's so many things I'd love to share with you and I've got such a time amount of time. And I'd just like to help you to continue this journey on building a strong, resilient bridge which will better equip you in all areas of your life, with your health, with your well-being, with your relationship, with your finances. You know, the, 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 if you fail to manage your stress, it has a deep and significant impact in all other areas of your life. That's why this program today, this webinar today, is called Reduce Stress to Achieve Success because you're more likely to achieve success when you're not operating from stress. 
So we've got lots of things. We've got like an online health assessment that we've developed. So it's a questionnaire which will give you a, an instant report with your health score and advice on changes and improvements you can make to optimize your well-being. Um, so there's details there. The link is available there. And we've got an online stress coaching tool with the same link. We'll provide you details of that. This, again, is uh, an, an online coaching uh, support tool which will ensure that you're able to, to get the answers and the, the, the support you need and bespoke advice to help you to deal with any issues or situations you find yourself uh, coping with. And I guess this comes down to sort of asking yourself, you know, when you think about your well-being, what is important? What is the value of your well-being? And we've, you know, considered how we can best support people in ensuring they get maximum value from their investment in well-being. And we developed what we call the Ten Step Stress Solution Bootcamp, which is based on my best-selling book. I'm, I'm really blessed that, that the, the, the the book that I wrote, the Ten Step Stress Solution, has been published in now something like. 15 different countries, um, and um, you, you know it's been become a bestseller on, on Amazon. So we're really pleased about that. And, and off the back of that, we have developed a bootcamp, which is essentially is a one day uh, a one day bootcamp, which is designed to bring those steps into life and help you to understand how you can incorporate that in your day to day routine. So I'm just reading it as passive information, considering how you create an action plan to bring that to life to give you the benefit in best equipping you to cope with stress. Um, for any of you that are managers, we've also developed a one-day managers managing stress program. This is about how to apply this in the workplace. So many of you may have uh, an interest in looking at how you can be better managers. Some of you may run your own businesses. So how can you use this not just for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the people that you work with and how you can use this with your teams? So there's a, there's a, a separate one-day workshop that's based around that. So. For those of you that have invested the time in attending today's uh, webinar, we put together a wonderful package uh, for you, which um, the 10 step stress solution bootcamp is normally £247, there's the online health assessment, there's a stress coaching tool, there's a copy of my book, which if you bought it, you know, just as individual components is worth £341.93. Um, after a bit of uh, arm twisting from Dave, we've created a special package for all of you listening today, and you can have access to all of that for £97. The Manager's Program, it's only £397 for the, 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 the one-day program. That's an ILM, Institute of Leadership and Management accredited program, so it leads to a recognized qualification, um, and this is a very valuable program. It's one of our most uh, popular and best-selling workshops. Um, that, that also includes the, the health assessment, the stress coaching tool, and the copy of the 10 stress stress solution. That total value is about or just short of 500 pounds, but for today, uh, you can have that as at, at pretty much half price for 247 pounds. So for any of you that are interested, if you would like um, to, to, oh, there's some bonuses, which I wasn't aware of. There's uh, some eBooks as well. So how to spot stress at work, the nutrition, stress and health, the sleep guide for, for those of you who are looking at how to better improve your sleep, the anxiety and how to deal with that, the stress uh, guide. So all of that, those five books will also be offered to you absolutely free of charge. Um, so if you're interested in uh, attending the 10 Step Stress Solution Bootcamp, so obviously you've got all the information there of what that package includes, there is a link there at the bottom. This is not a public link. That is only for people that are attending today. So if you go to www.stressmanagementsociety.org, so if you want to write that down, you'll find the, 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 the ability to book that, that package there. So obviously it will give you the ticket for the bootcamp and all the rest of that will come uh, as part of that. Uh, stressmanagementsociety.org. And then the Managers Managing Stress Package, which is um, inclusive of the, the Managers Program and all the other bits and pieces we talked about. And that one you go to, again, a very special secret link, which is uh, www.destress.co. So if you go to www.destress.co, you'll find all the information there about that package, and then you can book that up as well. Uh, I said that these are exclusive for you because you have invested an hour of your valuable time in being here today to listen to uh, some of the information that we had to share. We're not done yet because obviously we've got some time for questions and answers and there's some uh, additional information I'd like to share with you. Um, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity of um, uh, being able to take advantage of these wonderful offers that my team have put together for you. 
Also, um, for more advice and information, you can connect with us now. We've got our WordPress blog, which we uh, regularly post some really, really wonderful, innovative information on, on, on modern day experiences of stress. We've got our LinkedIn uh, account for, for, for those who are interested in more workplace issues, our Twitter, so there's regular Twitter feeds going on. Uh, we've got our wonderful Facebook and YouTube account if you're interested in looking at some of our videos. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a great video of, of the bridge which we put up recently, which many of you uh, may have seen in the run-up to this. So, you know, feel free to, to visit our social media channels. Um, and I'd really like to use the, 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 the time we've got left to, to, to kind of explore what questions you have and how I can help and serve you to the best of my ability. So, so Dave, have we got any questions? Excellent, Neil. I'm going to get a few questions. There's been a good few coming in throughout the call. But firstly, just a fantastic presentation, Neil. So much great information. And guys, I hope that you have taken lots of notes. Hope you've got even arm cramp from taking them. So keep Keep, um, as I said at the start, you know, focused on taking action, okay? Because Neil has shared some very, very valuable information there with you that some of his high, very highest paying clients get access to, and you've got access to this free. So make sure you take you take action on it. So well done, Neil. Um, we'll go through some questions. Oh, before that, you know, these, these offers that Neil is making for you, you know, go grab them. You know, when you look at what you're getting, you get access to such, you know, vital boot camps, huge information, ebooks. No, um, the assessments, everything for very, very reduced fees. So make sure you take advantage of them. I put the links to access them in the chat box. So just click the click the link, and you go and you get to get access to it straight away. So don't miss out on these offers. So we go through some questions. Need there's one particular one about nutrition. I'll leave for a little bit, and we can have a discussion on it. Um, let me see. Let's see. Do you one question that was a, a little bit recurring actually was you no? Know, how do you advise clients not to stop taking work home because you know yourself that can often lead to stress of course. Absolutely and you know what that's a great question because many of us find ourselves stuck in these vicious cycles because let's be honest work doesn't finish when you leave your desk it's not like you know 10, 15, 20 years ago for those you can remember back that far where we didn't have Blackberries and iPhones because you know these devices haven't been around that long. They've only been around for about 10, 12 years or so. There was a time before we had devices that were giving information to us at a rate of knots. And now, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, most people are plugged into the technology. In fact, we did some studies about three years ago with the University of Greenwich, and we swapped a thousand smartphones. And Dave, you'll be shocked to know that 27% of those had fecal matter on them. Because it seems that people are taking their phones into the toilet. They don't switch up long enough to use the bathroom in peace, let alone have downtime outside of work. No, it's so this is a real challenge because, you know, Dave, as a as an a, you know as an athlete, as someone that, that you know takes pride in competing professionally, what would you say about that one day a week? You know, when you're training six days a week, that one day a week when you're not supposed to train, how is it? How important is it to respect that one day? Exactly, like it's massively important because. You know, like that, when you're training and you're training six days a week, physically your body needs to rest. Like the, the bottom line is you get results from the recovery period as opposed to the training period. Like the training period is leading up to the recovery period. So that's the key. And it's the same like Neil's saying, when it comes to your busy work life and schedule, you too need rest. Absolutely. And you'll be more effective in your work if you take the rest and switch off. And you'll get more done in less time. Don't just take my word for it. Try that out. And basically, like I, I have a system. I have three types of days. I have what's known as a focus day where I'm completely focused on client stuff, on stuff that, that is helping my business to grow. I have buffer days where I'm catching up on emails, I'm having internal meetings. And I have free days. A free day is from midnight to midnight, I don't do anything work related. I don't check my emails, I don't check my phone, I don't speak to my colleagues, where I will just be able to disconnect. And then usually they're on a Saturday or a Sunday, or if I'm on, on, on vacation, I will completely switch off. Because I find that my free days help me be much better equipped to cope with my, my focus days. And I accomplish so much more when I structure my time that way. So, you know, guys, genuinely, as, uh, as Dave's already said, do, whether you're an athlete or you're talking about work, do not underestimate the importance of the rest periods. They are vital, and they will massively improve your performance. Hmm. And just to add to that, Neil, what you said, you know, there in terms of like your off time and so on, like what people need to get out of their head, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. 
So if you're in the right zone Absolutely. and you're organized and you've prioritized well enough, you could do more in two hours than some people spend 14 hours a day doing at work. I know people who do 14, 16, even 20 hour days at work and I probably get more done than they do in 30 minutes to 60 minutes because they're not focused, they're focused on the quantity and they're just work, 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 but not on the right stuff that's going to move them forward. So quality over quantity applies to everything. And it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier when we talked about the prioritization grid. Focus on the number ones. You know, those are where you're going to make you know the biggest impact, and that's where you're going to get the most benefit. Don't waste your time on the number fours. You could spend 14 hours doing number fours and not move any further forward. The number ones are where you get your benefit. Excellent. Yeah, so there's a couple of questions like that just to revise about the techniques for time management, how to decide what to do each day, how to fit the priorities. So again, your main advice with that is, you know, the different quadrants. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. So focus on the things that are going to have the biggest consequences and have the shortest time frames attached to them. Exactly. And, and when we grade things in that way, it becomes much more easy to have some kind of a logical uh, order to the task list rather than getting overwhelmed and then finding yourself in that rabbit in the headlight syndrome where you don't know where to start and you don't know what to do. And you know, I'm sure you've, there are people listening today that have had those times where on your computer you've got like 10 windows open, you've, there's emails that you started, you're in the middle of writing a report, there's um, another email that's coming, the phone's ringing, you're doing like 12 different things at once and not getting anything done. It's yeah. better to focus on one thing, get it done and move on to the next. Yeah, exactly. Like you focus on things that are going to move your life forward, and move it fastest. That's the key. And it, even like Neil, like what people need to do is even if they spend 10, 15 minutes, whether it be at night or in the morning, to look at everything they need to do and decide from there which actually is the number one priority or two or three or, you know, which ones they need to work on and then work through that list then. Is that kind of some of the techniques you devise? Absolutely. Um, because you know what? You don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Just just look at the, 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 the strategies and techniques of some of the most successful people on the planet and you'll find that... Yeah, Richard Branson is very well known for running very successful businesses. But do you think he checks emails? Do you think he sits there like you, you know, doing anything in terms of the day-to-day -day aspects of running those organizations? He's got people that does that for him. Now, the point I'm making is, you may think, well, I don't have people that can do these things for me. But the point is that he focuses on his strengths and the things where he can make the biggest difference within his organization. And that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Look at what your strengths are. And there might be things that are not necessarily your strengths, but the things that will give you the best results and will make the biggest difference and will have the most impact. Because that's where you'll be able to move forward. And the things that you may find on your bridge that you don't even need to do, they're the ones that actually prevent you from moving forward. So, you know, don't, don't get consumed into your emails. Don't get drawn into, you know, answering the phone if you don't have to. Um, and then focus on the things that actually will bring you more benefit. Excellent, excellent. And, you know, we'll just add to that, you know, the main thing is don't get drawn into expending your energy on what's important to other people, you know, folks on what's important to you. That's basically, like email, phone, yeah. Skype, everything. It's important to that person that's yeah. impacting you, but not necessarily for you. Yep. Yeah. And now, Neil, we're going to head in towards nutrition. There's two specific questions and obviously it's something we discussed talking about as well during the Q&A session between ourselves. But the um, first one we'll go to is, someone was saying in terms of the stress for them typically triggers eating, sometimes even alcohol consumption. You know, how do you recommend to counteract this? How to counteract these triggers? Okay, so obviously like, when we are stressed, we tend to reach for stimulants. You know, what happens is when you stay in a, a state of stress for long enough, you start to get exhausted. And that's when we start suddenly craving things like, you, you know, uh, caffeine, sugar, you know, things like chocolate, biscuits, cake, sweets, uh, nicotine, uh, which also is stimulant. Alcohol in small quantities is a stimulant as well. So all of that essentially is making the situation worse, not better. A lot of people don't appreciate the up to, research has suggested uh, that up to 40% of the stress that we experience, we have consumed. We've lit 
literally put into our bodies because of the poor diets, because of the highly processed foods that we eat, the, the, the foods rich in chemicals and uh, artificial preservatives and um, you know the cans of Coke with phosphoric acid in them and all kinds of nasty things that we're putting into our body. Meat, and you know, again, this is something I'm extremely passionate about. Oh, um, as with yourself, uh, Dave, I've, I've, I went vegan. It's been just over a year now that I've been vegan. It's by far the best decision I've ever made. That I live a completely plant-based uh, lifestyle, um, and you know, I noticed the difference massively. You know, I, I, I was halfway through training for an Ironman when I decided to, to turn vegan. My coach went spare. She's like, "Are you crazy? You're training for the you know one of the toughest endurance one-day events on the planet." And you want to do it and remove most of your valuable protein sources. But it's about educating yourself that how do you fuel yourself for the long distance event of life? And what is the best way to fuel yourself? And this is the interesting thing. But actually, when you understand this, this will transform your results in life. Rather than turning to things that make your situation worse, why not turn to things that can help you, that fuel your body, will nourish you, and fill you with vitality? So, you know, let's consider how we can eat for well-being and not eat for stress. Now, there are many food products, that processed foods, um, you know, factory farmed uh, animal products, which are filled with anti uh, antibiotics and hormone growth hormones and you know all kinds of nasty chemicals. Um, and also these animals at the point of death, they live a very stressful life and at the point of death they've obviously experienced a, a huge amount of dread, de uh, sorry, a huge amount of stress, which means that you know every tissue and fibre of their body is filled with adrenaline and cortisol. When you eat that, you're transferring their stress into your stress. You cannot consume the suffering of another animal without it becoming the suffering of yours. Now, okay, as you can tell, this is something I'm extremely passionate about. But that's because I've had a first hand experience of how amazing and wonderful the results can be. That I went from you know doing my 100 mile bike ride on a Sunday to having to run 13, 14 miles on a Monday morning, from you know earlier in the year, sort of April, May before I went vegan, where I do that, and I'd feel absolutely shattered on my Monday morning run because your legs are just dead from the day before. Literally within two months of going vegan, I was going out and doing those morning runs and feeling absolutely amazing and enjoying my runs and I, I couldn't get my head around it I thought maybe it's just psychological but what I've started to understand is my body can derive the energy it needs and the nutrient it needs far more easily from plant sources and it doesn't have to expend as much energy and experience as much stress to do so which means the energy return is much better and I'm working much more efficiently my body was so much more efficient so uh, you know Fueling yourself correctly, my relationship with food has changed dramatically. I don't look at food as just a sensory pleasure anymore. For me now, it's the fuel for life. And this is again, if you want to strengthen your bridge, just be aware that the things you consume will have one or two effects. Either they're going to help to strengthen and support your bridge, or they are going to be weakening it. If your bridge is already bowing and buckling, consider what you need to consume to ensure that you are building it for vitality, not for weakness. Excellent. Excellent. And it ties in with some of the questions coming in about the link between nutrition and well-being. You know, and you've explained it very well in terms of your perspective there. And I'll just add a bit from my own perspective because you know me and Neil share a passion for this plant-based living. And you know, we both have come from the completely opposite backgrounds. Like I, I went plant-based in January 2012. But for the previous, what would it have been? That's what, three, previous 17 years, I would have been a massive meat consumer, a massive supplement, in synthetic supplement consumer. I would have come from a bodybuilding background, and I was someone who looked at vegans as being, you know, this typical, stereotypical, unhealthy, look like they're dying from a disease. That was my kind of impression of them. It's this wacky, cult-like, you know, nearly like religion, you know, that people are following and, you know, my wife actually went vegan, it's 11 years ago and my son was uh, vegan from birth, which is now 10 years, but I thought it was insane and they said that's the background I came from, loads of meat consumption, loads of whey protein and all the other kinds of synthetic supplements and just thinking there's no way, like, like uh, Neil's coach, you know, there's no way you can repair muscles, there's no way you can build muscles, there's no way you can um, be a good athlete if you don't consume the animal proteins and you know, as Neil experienced, 
when I gave it a go and used myself as a guinea pig to see what would happen, I was pretty much astounded by the effects on my training. You know, the, the volume of training you can do without the niggles and the pains and the aches the following days, as well as the improvements in your times. Like I saw my times dramatically increase over the course of months compared to what they were, they were during a meat-based, um, animal product-based phase in the season before. So your recovery, and remember we go to stress earlier, it's all about recovery. Recovery is the key. And recovery, my, my speed, cycling, running, swimming, constantly getting faster, race to race, getting faster. And besides that, like, and maybe you can say a bit more about this now as well, in terms of just your overall feeling, your brain, the way it works, your energy, even sleep. If you have a night where, due to work, for whatever reasons, you might have less sleep, you know, you're not walking around like a zombie, you're not feeling like you're going to die, you're, you, you can get through it, you're fine, because your body is working at its optimum. Like, can you, can you, have you felt many of those benefits too, Neil? I imagine you have. 100 percent i'm i'm now uh, there were many other changes i've made um since going vegan i also now meditate uh yeah. twice a day um and uh, you know i sleep about six hours a night and my energy levels are far better than they've ever been i have accomplished more in the last year than i did in the last five years before that um last year was probably my best year ever in, in so many different fronts and you know as i said like okay i get excited about this and people think i'm just being evangelical but i've discovered something that is not only good for for me, but it's good for the planet, and yeah, it's something that is really, really important to me because I want other people to get the benefit. It's like that matrix moment where you've taken the blue pill and you see it, things for what they really are, and understand that actually we have so much power over not just our state, but also you know how we can work together to contribute to create a better planet for all of us. And you know, the, the one thing I would say, David, and hopefully that you you would agree with me, this with the advice I'd like to share with everyone: don't take my word for it. Don't take Dave's word for it. Try it for yourself. Try it for one month. You don't need to make a lifetime decision. Give it a uh, you know a reasonable, a fair trial for 30 days and see what happens. And I guarantee you'll be getting inside the both of us to just to, to, to be able to share how amazing you feel if you do it correctly. But the one thing I would say: educate yourself. Don't go into this without understanding how you fuel yourself appropriately on a plant-based diet because you will need to rethink your approach to food. You can't just go off and eat vegan junk food and expect to be feeling great. It's important that you do fuel yourself correctly and eat the right quantities of food because that's the whole thing. Your relationship with food will change. Yeah, 100% Neil, like with you and all of that because what people unfortunately do sometimes is they jump into things just way too hard, way too fast, put too, way too much demands on themselves. So, you know, as you said, you know, just put a 30-day target on it, make some improvements, research, educate yourself. It is so important to just keep educating yourself because, you know, Neil, as I did, you know, our minds change, our views change from education, and then that led to us making decisions to change our actions and what we actually consume, and that then has changed to what we do as a lifestyle. And now we incorporate this type of living as part of the advice that we give to our clients so that they can work to their optimum, so they can be super productive, so they can be more successful, have better relationships, feel better with themselves and so on. So, you know, make that commitment. 30 days is not very, very long. And you just have to make small changes, but make sure you educate. Like, that's an important point that Neil has made because you need to learn, you know, just the good thing with the internet now is there is so much information there and there's so many recipes. Someone adopting plant-based lifestyle now, it is not that hard. There are so many groups on Facebook, there are so many websites and blogs, so many videos that it's, it's not that hard. You just have to spend that little bit of time to go and search for what's there. So, you know, I can't speak highly enough for it. It's made a dramatic difference to my life and to that of my clients who have adopted it or who are on their own journey at the moment to adopting it fully. I've watched my son for the last 10 years thriving every single day and developing in his cognition and his ability just you know, everything he does and rarely if ever being sick, you know, a bit of a sniffle, that's about all in 10 years, which for any kid is pretty incredible. And that's what made the biggest impact on me. And like we've both said, for our training, if you're someone who, you know, you're a recreation trainer or you take it a bit more seriously or, you know, you compete as an athlete of some, of some sort, you know, the plant-based lifestyle will have a dramatic impact on your results. So, but just make the right change. Absolutely. And you don't need to take my word or Dave's word for it. If you look up people like Brendan Brazier, who was an elite Ironman triathlete, he did it on a, uh, a plant-based diet. Scott Durek, the world's leading ultra-distance runner, 
is a very active vegan. Um, Serena and Venus Williams, you may have heard of them, they play a bit of tennis. Yeah. Both happen to be vegans. David Hay, the boxer, also a vegan. Samuel Jackson, the actor, I mean, the list goes on. Yeah. These are people that understand not just the ethical argument, but also the performance argument. And as I said, you know, again, you have to experience this for yourself to really understand how powerful it is. Yeah, especially for the athletes, because for the athletes, their only concern is better performance and, you know, results, victories. Yeah. That's all they genuinely care about. You know, the planet and stuff like that, and animals, that comes into it usually secondary. Because, again, their main focus, remember, is to win and be the best of their mm-hmm. career. So when you see top athletes adopting a plant-based lifestyle, that should tell you, right, well, there's something to this. And there's even MMA. Lots. Of, I think it's Danzig is one of them. Um, you know, top MMA fighters who are doing this, which in something that's seen as the most macho kind of you know sport that's out there, to see MMA fighters adopting it really is an eye opener. Absolutely, and exactly as you said, Dave. Most of them, the, the ethical argument is secondary. The performance argument is what wins them over. So you know, whatever it is that that, that kind of uh, attracts you to this, you know, give it a go, see what happens. Yeah, excellent. So Neil, it's been, it's been a complete pleasure having you on. You know, you've shared so much valuable information. It's been great to hear of your own journey too in the plant-based lifestyle, because again, something I'm very passionate about, and we've such similarities and where we've come from and what we do right now. And you know, the information you've shared on stress and relieving it and overall productivity, it's just so valuable, you know, and makes such a difference in people's lives. And, I just hope the listeners, both live and anyone who watches the replay, are going to take action on it because it will dramatically change their lives forever. Fantastic. It's been a real pleasure, Dave. I hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you. And look forward to having you on again in the future, no doubt. Guys, I put the links in again into the chat box for, for Neil's kind packages. Make sure you grab one of them. Um, also, check him out. Get connected with him on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter. And check out his blog. In the follow-up emails, I'll include links to all of these as well. Um, and just keep spreading the word about Formula for Success live training every single week. Help us keep growing our global community where you know we look to make a big difference in people's lives. You, as I said at the start, congratulations for taking the time and investing in you to be on the show, on this particular show. But please take action on what you've learned and make this part of your weekly routine. Block it into your schedule. And as I said, keep um, spreading the word. And really appreciate if you post a comment about your experience of being on the show on the registration page. So this is Dave Sheen here. Looking forward to speaking to you on our next show. Have a fantastic week and focus on moving forward. Little steps at a time, just focus on consistent positive action. Take care and we'll speak to you next time.